Perspectives menu this week is looking particularly tasty with bread, fish and chips, cakes, some beer and ice cream for pudding. Food and hospitality businesses have been struggling with one crisis after another to deal with over several years, so how are they coping? What support are they getting from government? And what are they hoping for in this month's budget? I'm joined in the studio by Miles Pettit from Noah Bakehouse, David Matthews from Peel um, Fisheries Fish and Chip Shops, Amy Ford, a cake designer, Andy Saunders from Quids Inn and chairman of the Licensed Vitulars Association, and Ian Davison from Davison's Ice Cream. So I think if we start with um, maybe with you, Dave, uh, just tell us a little bit about who you are and, and wh- wh- what your business is. Uh, I'm David Matthews. So I've got three fish and chip shops in Peel, Peel Fisheries, the Colin Castle and Quayside Fish and Chip Shop on the Quay. Um, I've been running them for the last eight years. Right, okay. Um, and then if we move on to uh, uh, Andy... Uh, yeah, I'm Andy Saunders. I've I've been in Quid's Inn for thirty years this year. Uh, it's obviously been a successful little place, but it, times are it, it's harder than ever to for any of our hospitality businesses to continue to be profitable in this time and age. And I also represent the Ardermans uh, Licensed Fitchers Association, uh, which represents uh, over sixty pubs and hotels, restaurants throughout the island. Ian Davison. Yeah, afternoon, Phil, and to the listeners. Um, I've got Davison's Ice Cream in Peel. Um, been in business with the ice cream side for over 30 years now. Been in business since 1988 on the Isle of Man. A local supplier of ice cream. So we're suppliers, manufacturers, retailers, wholesalers. Um, and that's what we do on the island. We employ about 33 staff. And uh, as I say, we, we've been going for that amount of years integral part of the dairy industry on the Isle of Man, farming, um, and that's what we do. Amy, then, uh, tell, tell us about cake designing, because I'm not entirely sure what, what that is. Yes, so um, I actually I make all types of cakes. Um, my primary focus would be wedding cakes, um, so the wedding industry is really important to me. But I do supply some local cafes, restaurants, and the general public with any type of cake that they're after. Okay. And Miles, um, Miles and Amy are sharing a microphone here, so uh, uh, let's hope this works. Uh, Miles, tell us tell us a bit about uh, your business. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Miles. I'm one of the uh, co-founders of Noah Bakehouse. Um, we uh, employ over sixty people, and not only do we produce bread, cakes, roast coffee, um, brew beer. Uh, we also um, run uh, multiple different. Uh, coffee shops around the island okay well th- go, going back then to um sorry I'm, I'm trying to remember everyone's names going back to dave um how, how has the recent i mean re- i suppose we're going back to to just before covid um and ha- how have things changed over this last two or three years where you know, obviously you've had to cope with covid and the, all the associated problems with that you've then had um, the, over the course of the last 12 months, the, the in, incredible uh, energy prices to deal with. How, how is that Im- impacting your business? We were okay through COVID, actually, because we just we were allowed to open. So we diversed our business and done deliveries. So that kept us afloat and kept us trading and kept all our staff on through the whole of the COVID pandemic. Um, it was after COVID, really, but it started to hit for us the cost of living and stuff like that when the when the war started mainly it was the perfect storm for for the fish and chip industry with the price of oil skyrocketing overnight the price of fish doubled um which are our two main products that we need along with spuds which are grown manx um and then the gas bills and the electricity bills come in and they're just astronomical at the minute they're literally thousands upon thousands um, and wh- where's it going to end really mm-hmm. um, there is a cap on the electricity at the minute I think it finishes the end of March I'm not too sure so I don't know what's going to happen then um, along with the gas is it going to rise is it going to drop who knows what the way the gas board is at the minute 
I don't think they actually know. Okay. Um, Andy, I mean, obviously your, your business at uh, Quids Inn, but also uh, generally across the, the hospitality trade, uh, licensed victuallers and the like, um, <clears throat> How have things been? Because the, there is an assumption that uh, people got used to not going out and they just don't go out anymore. That's certainly the case, yeah. Uh, there is a change in everybody's lifestyles. Uh, it was obviously coming along before COVID, just a change in the way people spent their leisure time as it became more digitalised and so on, and people could interact with each other through social media and so on. Uh, so people were... That habit of going to the pub to meet your friends or going to the restaurant for how, how do you get a, a digital time. pint exactly you don't get that do you? <laughs> but but a lot of people are quite happy to drink out of a can or something that's purchased from local <clears throat> from a, a huge supplier around the place but that doesn't come along with the with the community aspects of pubs the entertainment aspects the uh just meeting along with each other and so on and uh, so we've had that difficulty be coming and then we obviously had COVID where we were closed down by the government and unable to operate our businesses. And then after this, the cost of living crisis has come in and uh, everything is skyrocketing. Everything for every single business anywhere is skyrocketing. Uh, the the cost along with that. Um, but if you tell anybody in the Manx public or anywhere else that we need to put 20p on a point, it's obviously very, uh, very uh, negative responses that come from that. Ian, uh, Ian Davison, um, oh, you'd imagine that people would still uh, go out and buy an ice cream. Uh, have you noticed a particular downturn in trade? Well, um, during the COVID years, we were, we were fine, to be honest, because we diversified our business into home delivery straight away. And that was something we were put into operation very quickly um, with delivery vehicles, online shop and everything already set. So those years were good for us. Um, we were doing deliveries island-wide. But since then, and I think a lot gets blamed on the war in Ukraine, I know from certainly from Dave's perspective with the fish and chips, the, the sunflower oil and the cost of fats and things have rocketed. But our business, um, we have had minimum price rises of 150% up to 450% in the last two years. So that's what we've had to try and cope with. We've had manufacturers month on month increasing pricing structures to us. Um, milk powders, um, cream, even locally produced items. Um, we had a 40% rise overnight from one of the, from our main supplier on the island. Um, and it's been really difficult to cope. Um, as Dave from the Chippy says as well, um, gas prices, electricity prices are rocketing. Um, our last electricity bill um, was for eight and a half thousand pounds, and that's just running our factory at the present time. Um, and our parlour in Peel, the electricity bill there was seven and a half thousand pounds. These prices, along with all of the costs in that we're having to bear and try and maintain a, a, a price that we can still get for our product, there's only so much people are prepared to pay, and we're scared that we'll come to that point soon and then obviously people find what you're trying to sell unaffordable so we're, we're very conscious trying to with the economic situation out there at the present time trying to watch how much we can increase our product by but obviously we do need to increase because we, we've had massive increases and just recently 15 percent again on cones um along with another hundred percent we had to hike last year on them um it's, we just don't really know where it's going to end, and we do need some form of stabilisation from the Isle of Man government to help us along the way. Amy Ford, uh, in, in terms of your uh, cake designing business, I, I suppose if people have less money or, or feel as though they have less less money available to spend, um, that, that's going to impact particularly on the sort of thing that you do. Yes, definitely. I mean, when COVID hit, obviously... I wasn't alone um, in that my entire order book was cleared instantly overnight. Um, I was very quick to diversify and like Ian and Dave went down the home deliveries route. Um, but I'll be honest, I was more like a busy fool. It kept me going, but it didn't make me money. I wasn't making loads of profit from that. I was just keeping the wolf from the door. 
Um, and then since we've gone back to normal times as everybody feels it is, unfortunately, people's spending habits have changed. The wedding industry is not going to recover probably for another year or two yet. Um, people simply were not getting engaged whilst they were locked down together because I think most of them probably wanted to throttle each other, to be quite frank. <laughs> but... Um, but it just wasn't happening. There weren't the engagements. And when people aren't getting engaged, it's it's a year, two years down the line when they would be getting married. And that's when you then get that hit. So this year, for example, is probably going to be the lowest year for weddings we've had for a very, very long time. Everyone in the wedding industry is feeling it. Um, next year looks a bit better. But I did a wedding fair a few weeks ago and every bride that walked through the door was saying 2025. And that's great. But we've got two years to get through till then. And it's a case of trying to survive. Um, but as you say, people's spending habits have changed. And when prices have risen, my eggs are now three times the price they were two years ago. And I have to pass that on. I can't absorb that. I did as long as I could. And it, it ends up where you have to pass that price increase on. And then people turn around and go, how much for a cake? And I'm saying, well, it's not just a cake. And, you know, when those basic ingredients are costing as much as you think the cake should cost, and I've then got my time on that as well, it's it's actually not expensive, but obviously it looks expensive from the outside looking in. Um, so, yeah, it's very, very difficult trying to encourage people um, when times are tough. And, and Miles, uh, fi- finally there on, the, on, on microphone one, um, presumably... I mean, your you, your business model it tends to be a, a um, you know a, a, a specialist bakery type, mm. type market. So so um, people who who buy your product tend are, are used to paying a little bit more than they would for the the kind of the mass bake uh, uh, bread. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think you can hear from everyone who's just spoken before. It's there's only. Uh, so much a business can absorb costs before they pass it on. But I think our biggest worry across the board here is if we keep passing that on to the customer, where does it stop? When did the customer stop coming through the door and how are you exposed as a business? You know, when, you know, you, you, I think there's no margin and that's the thing. There's no margin for any of these businesses uh, in the hospitality sector right now. Uh, we all do it. We all work antisocial hours and work at weekends and work at night because that's what where our customers come from. But there comes to a point when you, as a business owner, goes, wait a second, I'm, it's costing me to run my business or I'm not making any margin here and uh, I don't want to do it anymore. And then you end up with an island with nothing, you know, no social, you know, I, I think of, you know, Douglas Prom without pubs you know the you know the quayside without the the barbary coast run it, it's not you know that's not a night out you know it's not you know i don't want to be on an island man like that and we've got to protect this because it's it's i feel that it's it's going and we've all got to act now to sort of make sure that you know actually our hospitality hospitality sets is there for um you know the tourist trade that's going to kick off in a few months time andy um We've had this this sort of thing before, haven't we? Where, um, well, oh, certainly during my lifetime, I, I, I remember as a uh, pr- uh, probably younger than I should have been uh, lad uh, in my uh, mid to late teens, uh, there were several, oh, well, six or seven mm-hmm. pubs in Port St Mary, six or seven pubs in, in Port Erin, probably more than that in Port Erin. Um, and now the number has diminished quite substantially over, over the, you know, a long uh, period of time. So, is is this just a change in you know an inevitable change in the way in which people live their lives, or is this something a bit more serious? Do you think? Well, no, we have to accept that the culture and the way that and people's spending habits and so on, and the way they meet each other has changed. So there is obviously a natural reduction of that, but that's come gradually over years when people moved out of the business and other places were developed as well and people have changed their um, their business models to reflect that so nowadays a pub's not just about you come in after work you meet all of your 10 lads that are mates from round and you talk about your day at work and then you go home have your tea maybe come back out with the lady later on and all have a chat together so lots of people have and with everybody around here 
sorry, have really redeveloped businesses rapidly every time we have to make a change. Uh, and that, that's what's happened. Pubs are very much entertainment sectors uh, bases now. Uh, you you have to create a reason for anybody to come into your establishment uh, and make it sort of unique in whatever way you choose to do that. Uh, but at the same time, we're getting to a situation now where the, just the cost of actually operating any small business is becoming prohibited. The, the other side, of course, to uh, to running a business is you have to have staff to, to, yeah. to be able to, to, to do this. Um, has there been a check? Because there generally seems to have been a, a reduced number of available uh, staff, particularly for lower paid jobs, possibly uh, as a result of Brexit. Uh, is that something that you've noticed at all? Phil, first of all, the first thing I'd like to say is hospitality is not a low paid industry anymore. Okay. It's absolutely not. We are paying well above minimum wage uh, in everywhere, uh, and, or you just don't get the stuff. I know lots of people, we are paying well above what many, many of the health workers in the, uh, in, in Manx Care are getting, and that's where we're at. So this fallacy that we are low paid is uh, continuing to cause issues for, for staff-wise, but it's not the situation. Uh, and yes, there is a, a shortage of people that want to work, but it's more to do with antisocial hours. And uh, just a change in people's habits full time, you know, the second the secondary employment was always something if you were a little bit strapped for cash or you were a youngster and you were trying to save up for a house and get a job somewhere and get a second job somewhere and fill it up. And that's how you made your deposit. I see a lot of a lot of younger people now going, doesn't matter what I do, I'm never going to get a deposit for a house on the Isle of Man. So why am I going to give away my weekends for something that I'm not going to be able to achieve. There's lots of issues that are all piling in together. Dave, are you um, having struggles getting getting staff? or, or uh... we've, we've got very good staff, um, but we are on the lookout. We are, we're always on the lookout for, for more, but there's there's not many people about there. I, I, we are, we're not in the central Douglas either, so we're in Peel. Um, th- we've found it hard for a couple of years to get staff. Again, we pay well above minimum wage. Um, we always have done, um, but I believe the government are planning to put minimum wage up by a significant amount, which I do agree with in a way, um, because people need more money to live. Um, but the f- reality fact of that is that prices are going to have to go up mm-hmm. to to cover that. But so the consumer is going to have more money because they're going to get more paid but then they're going to spend more money on what they're buying um, it's just a vicious cycle um, yeah. Ian Ian Davison then uh, I mean with, with the minimum wage uh, subject has been broached um, if as, as seems to be the case there's less available money for people to spend and then government is now about to introduce a significant increase in minimum wage um, presumably that means that services somewhere that, that people are buying from uh, are going to become more expensive because what's blatantly obvious from everything that's being said here is um, you can't afford to absorb um, any more significant uh, cost increases. Um, it, it has, has there been much by way of consultation with uh, the, the sector in relation to the change to the minimum wage um, at all? Well, there was a public there was a public consultation I seen advertised, and we responded to that consultation. Um, as I know, a few different businesses I showed it to uh, responded to it as well. I know my brother did from the T Junction, um, and I'm sure other businesses around the island did. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, with government consultation, they and, and you'll you'll be well aware, and and uh, they put it out, but they really don't want many people to respond, so they try and put it for a short period of time and uh, whatever. So we did respond to the to it. And I should say, I'm sure if anyone from the government was here, they would say, no, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not it at all. Uh, ten years on a local authority taught me that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I quite agree with really what Dave sort of said. It, we're struggling to get staff at the moment. Um, there isn't the supply of staff that we used to have years ago. Um, an awful lot of people that used to come just don't it's it's a nightmare um we struggle to get local people we advertise jobs we've got jobs advertised at the moment 
um, and they've been there for months and and we're paying the same as these boys well over minimum wage minimum wage is going to hit us again because it's just a complete and utter vicious circle as much as i yeah you know, i agree people need the money to be able to live um and we've got staff with us for over 30 years it, it is a struggle and and it's just this vicious circle the more money we give to people the more prices have to increase in order that we can then uh, stay in business because as miles said our margins are, are cut that bad now and we deliver uh, fuel prices are high fuel price caps coming off uh, it's it's just a real vicious circle for us to, um, at the moment phil miles um are, are you struggling to to fill all the available posts that you have i, I think uh i mean recruitment across the world is in a dire place and you know you can see the hospitals shutting vital healthcare parts at the moment because they can't you know they can't get people in so you, you know i think that's it across the board we all have that crutch but i, I guess with the minimum wage increase I'm sure government's got a strategy. I'm sure government's got a great plan um, to maybe up national insurance so it gives people more free pay to go out and spend. It would maybe relieve a bit of burden on the businesses. You know, I, I'm what I like to see with stuff like the minimum wage is the thought process behind it. It's not maybe just passing that cost on to the private sector. I'm sure government's got a plan to help get that middle squeeze uh, you know the people in that middle income bracket out spending money again because that's what we all need because of course um, everyone around here has said that they pay more than the minimum wage anyway mm. but if you are going to continue to pay more than, than the minimum wage and the minimum wage significantly increases then you're going to have to increase yeah. The, yeah. The, the extra that you paid uh, yeah, above and beyond uh, minimum wage isn't about we want everybody to be receiving that amount of money it appears that in government sometimes that's really where we're, they're trying to get to not so much with the banks but with government overall mm. you know that the minimum wage is really where they want everybody's wage to be but uh the expense of anything that when it goes up everybody's wages will go up the minimum wage drives everybody's wages up mm. because you have to keep that buffer gap. between that gap and everybody and the, the skill sets and all so on um, but what we need to tackle and what the gov Manx government could tackle is the cost of employing people uh, and, and, and another thing that you can tackle from the employees situation is how much tax they have to pay on second jobs and things like that, that's one of the yeah. huge reasons why we don't get people coming into yeah. hospitality and so on as a second job now, because they don't see the benefit of it when they go out and work when that pay packet comes in with all of that national insurance taken out all of that extra tax taken out they go, is it really worth me giving up a weekend for this? That's the kind of thing that we need to look at Final word then to Amy before we take a break um, I, I, I I don't know. Um, do you employ uh, staff? or? Uh... So I used to. Yeah. Pre-COVID I did. Um, obviously, when we came out of COVID, situations had changed. Um, a lot of the clients that I previously supplied wholesale to had decided to bring it in-house um, and utilise their existing staff in better ways to cut costs. Um, so those contracts were gone. Um, so I haven't needed to recruit again. But if I did, I'd find it hard because I work silly hours they're never regular i need someone flexible that person doesn't exist anymore people have got used to having time to themselves time with their friends time with their family they now prioritize that time off whereas before mindset was different pre-covid but they had a lot of time kind of together at home and they want to keep that going which is understandable but it does hit industries where you're not a nine to five regular job where you need someone flexible where you need random hours things like that i'd struggle to get somebody now well i think uh, with that it's time to hear from our sponsor <laughs> welcome back to perspective where i'm joined by miles pettit dave matthews amy ford um andy saunders and ian davison um dave you, you were talking there a little bit about the uh, the the, the the costs of uh, the the well 
you're a chip shop, so spuds is a, is a good example. Uh, farmers have, have, have faced sub- substantial increases. Are, are these increases all being passed on, do you think? Um, we buy all our potatoes um, from a Manx farmer, and we've used the same one since day one. I I can only go on what he's saying. I don't believe they're passing all of the... Well, I'm, they're not passing all of it on because I know they were paying £220 a tonne for fertiliser and it went up four times the amount. Obviously, their fuel's gone up. They've got irrigation systems to run. They've also got staff um, vans. So it's hitting them as well as hitting us. But, yeah, they, yeah this, they have gone up. Yeah, they have gone up. Um, I think we've had a couple of increases on them. Yeah. And, and fish, you also mentioned that uh, that, had, that had increased dramatically. Fish skyrocketed overnight as soon as um, the war started, um, over 100%. Um, it did drop slightly, but then rise again. So, um, again, we were told the war was probably going to finish by January, the middle of last year. So we kept our prices. We, we took the majority of on on the chin ourselves, um, but it's it's not looking like it's coming down drastically anytime soon now so unfortunately the prices will have to increase i would say yeah so how does a war in a landlocked country like ukraine impact on the um, price of fish well, they just, well it's not uh, landlocked entirely but but you know what i mean well everything just gets blamed on the war doesn't it yeah, yeah. everything got blamed on covid for two years now everything gets blamed on the war you know the wholesale price of gas is cheaper now than it was before the start of the war yet we're still paying the astronomical gas prices and electricity prices so i don't really understand it i don't really look into the depths of it but there's the reality facts for yeah it. you just have to pay the bills you just as have to say. pay the bills otherwise we get cut off so yeah. um, we do pay our bills you know i know there's people out there that don't but we do we're mor- we run our business morally and we pay all our bills straight away as soon as we get them yeah, yeah. miles um the uh, obviously, there was a, a, a much uh, trumpeted and, and uh, uh, lamented uh, incident last year in relation to Ramsey Bakery closing. Um, the, there was a lot of talk from government about what they were going to do. Um, are, are we any closer to, to replacing the bread that uh, used to be supplied by Ramsey Bakery with Manx uh, bread? I, I'd like to hope they're getting a little bit closer, but they're still talking about it internally, about their plan. And uh, I think... Um, the bakers, the fa- the farmers and everyone's waiting to hear which way the government wants to go before we can start planning what we're doing um, I think it's frustration being felt, if I'll be honest, from all sides and I just hope that they you know, fundamentally ask the most important question is, do they want Manx flour? Do they want a, mi- a mill? And I hope it's yes, because um, I know I do mm. Cause, Because it, I mean, it, it seemed to me at the time quite extraordinary that with the backdrop of a war in Ukraine, Ukraine being one of the largest suppliers of milling wheat in, in Europe, um, that we would not do everything in, in our power to, to ensure that we, we retained a, a strong milling wheat sector on the island. It's, yeah, I think so too. I mean, that's it. it it's, it's, um, it's painfully obvious, really, for me. But, um, you know, actually what the war allowed was for farmers to ship for the first time ever to be able to make money by shipping their wheat to the UK. Now, wheat prices are changing and uh, it's no longer viable for them. And, you know, these farmers are are now left with an uncertain time ahead and some really tough choices on what they're meant to be doing. So, again, we really need uh, the mill, treasury, uh, DEFA all to make some, you know, decisions and decisions yesterday, really. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, the milling wheat for this harvest is already planted um, mm. it, it tends to be pl- uh, a winter winter wheat um amy uh, uh, do you have any um uh, sort of local suppliers manx manx food uh, suppliers or yes yes so i use local wherever i can um i use obviously alman creamery are fantastic with me in the sense that they um they do massive big blocks of butter for me (laughs) big 25 kilo blocks of and it's unsalted which they don't do for the public um but they're very good for local businesses and there's a few of us i know davison's get some off them as well for their diabetic ice cream um and that's great but again there was a price rise overnight and these things 
can't be helped in a sense, but it's always a shock when when you get the bill and you realise something has gone up by a considerable amount. Um, and yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, I use Lexi flour in some of my products, but in others it requires a special speciality cake flour, which I have to bring in, which obviously the war in Ukraine has impacted the price on that already. But we're going to see the real impact kind of later this year. Um, and I expect the price on that to at least double. But that's that, there's nothing really that can be done about that from my perspective. Um, but I do try and use local wherever I can. It's it's important. And Andy, uh, uh, obviously the um, we, the well at one point there was a, a proposal and a plan to try and get um, Manx uh, brewers barley. Um, but I don't mm. think that ever uh, quite managed to get off the ground, did it? So, so most no. of the ingredients yeah. for 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 the beer, uh, well, I think all the ingredients are, are sourced mm. out, are off the island. But uh, obviously, you you serve food and things like this in 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 the pubs yeah. around the island. Mm. Um, um, how big an impact is the the costs to to the sort of the primary producers, uh, you know, the farmers? Uh, how big an impact is that having on, it's on... Tr- in hospitality? The costs throughout the sector in every form are skyrocketing, and as we've all talked about, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what product you're really putting through. The cost, just of, as we heard on the news earlier, the, the the fuel cost alone is going to put an extra percentage on the cost of everything. Uh, all we can do is try and keep that to a minimum. I mean, we saw. As the war kicked off in Ukraine, uh, national newspapers in the UK talking about £10 pints of lager and things like that. L- luckily, so far, we've managed to be able to keep that down a little bit. But as everything continues, there the will come a time when prices will be driven to a place where, unfortunately, I can understand people have to say, well, I can't afford to pay that for something. Do you My- think Do you think sometimes the... Um, uh, the, the- because of all the scare stories that we mm. see both in in the the press and on the radio uh, on the telly um that actually the, the 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 story isn't as bad as as perhaps the headlines might suggest or is it as bad as the headlines no that, that, i think that's very true I, I was very concerned at the start of the winter that the the story going through the national press was scary people to come in hasn't been that bad it's uh, we have seen a downfall in in travel throughout or a footfall throughout the industry but it's not been that bad and it's not that's not the issue which is most damaging for all of our businesses people are out there willing to spend in our community and they're still coming out we're still seeing people come out all weekends, especially at weekends and so on, it's the footfall is actually quite good. It's the expense of the business from the other end that's always causing the issues. Miles, I, I think uh, Noah's always been a really proud su- supporter of supporting local. My biggest worry is that with all these costs going up, you have to start saving at some point. And if you're paying twenty percent more for using a local product, when is it that you suddenly go, wait a second? If I bought my potatoes in from somewhere else, that's going to save me a bit of money here, and I'll be able to pay the gas prices, or you know. And that's the biggest fear. It's like actually, you know what? The, it, it it's the impact on these costs it stops you as a business making the choices that you want to make. You have to make the choices that you can afford to make, and that becomes a really scary time. And yet, in in relation both to climate change and in, uh, indeed to the, the the situation that we've we've been seeing with regards to the war in Ukraine, you know what's what seems to be clear is having uh, much shorter supply chains is 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 not only good for the environment but it's also a more sustainable way of of doing things. Um, and yet, what you're basically saying here is uh, there's only so much further you can go before you're going to have to 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 look to a longer supply supply chain, but with a cheaper product. I think food security is going to be one of the major issues of the future. And right now, the Isle of Man can do it. You know, we have everything around us to to really give ourselves a great food strategy. But what is the food strategy, and and where is that going? Because if um, you know, we, you know, we need farmers, and if they can't afford to to grow and produce we, you know it's it's the impact is you know it's it's detriment for the whole island and it might not be now and it might not be through this cost of living crisis but it is going to be in 10 years time when the whole world has changed by this 
by the war and the cost of living crisis and we're all looking a lot more within what we can produce within ourselves. Ian, are you um, convinced by government's message or indeed do you understand government's message in relation to um, the food and hospitality? I don't think there is. As far as I know, there's no strategy for food at the present time. Um, I've got Claire coming down uh, to the factory. I'll be able to ask that question. That's Claire Barber, the Claire minister. Barber, yeah, yeah MHK yeah. for DEFA. Mm. Um, and see, uh, there used to be uh, a food strategy. Um, <laughs> I think when you were minister for the DEFA yourself, there was a strategy going forward. Um, I haven't. don't think there is at the present time. Um, I also noticed that one of the government departments... Um, said uh, in in recent press publication I, i've got it on my phone but um that they were monitoring different businesses and and getting reports in as to how different businesses were doing on a monthly basis well we've never ever been contacted and we are uh, one, one a, like a unique type of manufacturing process and also we're buying as much local as we possibly can um moving on to the subject that miles has brought up as well so at the moment, we buy in from the three independent creameries here on the Isle of Man, which is Cools in Putterin, Aylan, uh, Solby, and Alaman Creameries for the bulk. The two smaller independents that we deal with, we take everything that they can't sell retail, and we take that in bulk off them. And we use, <clears throat> we use that, and we have done for donkey's years from both of those suppliers, Aylan, as long as they've been going, and Cools probably 15 years. Um, and... We had a, we just set all our pricing structures last year, and then overnight um, we had a forty percent increase from Alaman Creameries in in prices. And and since then, I mean, everything around about our business has just gone rocketing. Now, Miles mentioned about buying in from the UK. For us to use as much local product as we can, I can buy those items cheaper from the UK and be more profitable and saving money but I like to think that we are a key supporter and of the Alaman farming industry and the dairy farming industry and and we don't want to ever go down that route if we can help it but um, we would be far more profitable as a business if we did but then obviously I'm Manx and I'm sticking with my local farming community as much as I possibly can and buying off them it's it's just going to be a struggle going forward i think the, uh, well let, let's have a think then about the the budget that's coming up uh, a week on tuesday the treasury minister alex allenson will be um announcing to the island um all, all the exciting things that uh, his budget over the course of the next 12 months is going to pay for uh, what what are the things in that budget uh, ian that you would be looking for from from government um, I'd like to see how our energy, because that's one of our, our biggest problems. I mean, electricity, gas are some of the things that we use. It'd be interesting to see what, if national insurance changes. Um, but any support that he could offer to local business at the moment, caps on things would be great to continue for businesses um, so that we have at least an understanding of where our electricity is going to be in, in a year's time. It's hard to, to set pricing structures when you don't know from one minute to the next what's increasing in price because we just don't know with fuel and commodities going up. Um, we'd also like, I mean, uh, although it's not probably going to be in the in, in the budget, um, some form of help from getting items into the Isle of Man carriage. And I know that one of the government departments is looking at export and that's another thing that we can't export because we can't be competitively priced. Um, but budget-wise, I'd like to see some caps on things and national insurance, see where we go with that. Um, if there's any possibility of VAT reduction, but I know that's set by the UK and it's very difficult for Alamand government to do things. But I don't know, we just have to see what he comes up with. Uh, Andy, any, any thoughts as to... What, what, yeah, that is exactly what Ian said about national insurance. We We can do that by just changing the boundaries. And we should make uh, people on the lower end of the earning scale more put more money in their pocket by increasing the thresholds of which you start to pay tax and national insurance. If we want 100,000 people on the island, which is the government's, well, not plan, just 
throw a throw a number in the air and see what's going to happen. And we want those to be working people. We have to make it a, a place that working people want to come to. And the way to do that is to make sure that when you come here, if you're a nurse, if you're a teacher, that far more of your salary remains in your pocket. And that's where they can do that. And they can do that by just pushing the thresholds up and pushing the higher end thresholds up to balance the books, can't they? Uh, that's really where I think it should be at. And that's making employment cheaper is obviously the way to, for any country to go, really. And, and certainly, that's what we can do here. Certainly in the uh, Isle of Man government, our island plan yeah. conference that uh, uh, took place in September, um, I, I attended most of it uh, to, for, for, for my sins. And um, the Treasury Minister at that conference did indicate that actually we pay far too much by way of personal tax. Uh, and actually that, that's... Uh, demonstrated quite starkly in a, a, a an election a video uh, an election a, a budget video that we've we've produced at Manx Radio mm -hmm. where um, just just one percent of the total income for government comes from company tax and something in the region I, I can't I can't remember the exact figure now something like 40 45 percent is um, employment tax effectively mm -hmm. national insurance and income tax that's a big chunk of, of, of our income. Um, so you would perhaps, well, I don't know, how, how, how would you suggest that government uh, alters things? I mean, is it, is it that we need to start charging company tax and uh, um, uh, re reduce the employment tax that way? Do we spend more of the reserves? How, how would we do that? Uh, I'm maybe a little bit left wing <laughs> on this uh, situation. I, don't, I think taxing capital that's on the island is the way to do it, really. Okay. Uh, you know, there are other taxes that we can go on, but really, I'm all for having our people get as much money as they can into their pockets, and that means that we have to look at other in income streams. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, there are there are dangers to that, but. Uh, at the same time, there is room for uh, capital taxes on the Isle of Man. Dave, um, you, you've obviously heard what Ian and Andy have, have got to say. What, what, what would you think would be a, a, an ideal thing for Alex Allenson to say when he announces this budget? Our main thing is the the, the energy bills. We need to know going forward. We need a strategy on them, really. Um, a 12-month strategy would be good. I, I can't see them doing it. Um, but that's our, that would be our biggest for our business, that we knew that they're not going to go up 100% again or 50%, because if they are, that, that that's huge. Um, are they going to lift the cap on the electric? Because if they do, I, I think it's 40%, isn't it? If they do, it's going up 40% straight away. And... They've already ploughed in 21 million. They're going to want that back, so it's going to go up more to get this 21 million back. So who knows? But that would that would be our yeah. And again, the national insurance agree with these guys as well. Something on. Amy, um, have you any any particular thing that you hope the Treasury Minister will be saying um, to to encourage people to go out and get married, for example? I think um, it would be lovely to be able to encourage people to go out and get married. This year would be the year to do it because all your suppliers would be available. <laughs> um, there really isn't much there. Um, I think the wedding industry is a, for a forgotten industry. Um, it was very much so in terms of support. I was lucky because I fall into kind of the, the kind of the hospitality catering sector as well. So I I did get some support from government. Um, the majority of the wedding industry did not. They didn't qualify for any grants. They didn't qualify for any support scheme. They got nothing. They were completely forgotten and abandoned. And when they raised the question, what about me? You know, I'm a wedding photographer. I clearly have no no business. They were, they were just told, sorry, you don't fall into any of our categories. Um, so I think it's it's really sad that an industry that actually generates quite a lot of money on the island. I know kind of the figures for the UK. It's you know it employs four hundred thousand people in the UK, generates fifteen billion pounds for the economy. So it's it's a, if you think of that as a scale back onto the Isle of Man, you've got the wedding industry is huge. <coughs> it's massive. It employs a lot of people, um, but it is a completely forgotten industry, and there is no support for us. So it would be nice if 
government would actually kind of look at some of the industries that they see as potentially see as being frivolous and a luxury and unnecessary. But unfortunately, whether they like it or not, that employs a lot of people and it does generate a lot of income for them. And they need to remember that there's not it's not just about some of the industries that they see as being the most profitable for them. You know, there's a very big focus on um, the gambling, online gambling and things like that. Um, and they do seem to forget about things like my personal opinion, you know, food and things like that. Um, we're the forgotten industries. So it would be nice if they actually kind of looked a bit closer at where are the businesses on the island? Who, who, are, who are they employing? What industry are they in? Who's, who's there that needs the help? Um, not necessarily the ones that shout the loudest. Miles, are, are you um, hoping for, for um, uh, the Treasury Minister to, to drop some goodies in your lap um, when he announces his budget? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know I'm with I'm with everyone else here with National Insurance. I think giving uh, the is it, they call it the middle squeeze more f- mm. money in their pockets and allowing people to go out and spend more money in hospitality is going to help us all. I'd like to see uh, a tax reduction on secondary jobs. And, uh, you know, I don't know, you you look at it, it's hard times out there at the moment. The private sector is making some really hard decisions looking at how many people they employ, what they're doing internally within the business. Now, government is the biggest employer on the Isle of Man. Has it done any of the hard decisions like the private sector is having to do? You know, I'd like it to reflect on its own practices a little bit more to see how internally they can be structured to to help save the taxpayers money well sadly we've we've only got a, a few minutes left so a very quick um uh, troll through uh, the the various businesses represented here uh, so if we start with you uh, dave uh, are you optimistic for the future um I think we'll I think we'll always I think we'll always be here. You've always got to eat. Um I think we'll always hopefully be here. Um optimistic. I, I don't know whether it's the right word. It it's just going to be a tough couple of years really I think and hopefully battle through and and see what happens on the other side but hopefully we'll all be here and I'm confident we'll be here in a few years. Yes, definitely. Good. Um, yeah. Andy uh, for my industry, uh, there's, there's going to be lotters. There is going to be lotters. Uh, but people have to adapt to that and they'll have to think. What we don't need are, are lead civil servants and government ministers thinking along the lines as it doesn't matter if a pub or a restaurant shuts. Another one will open next week. We're seeing closures every week reported now uh, in the press on the island. And that's it's not just... A business that's gone it's not a revenue stream that's gone it's a community in these places these are some place all of these places have built up a community a, a business that has been going for 30 years the loss of that business isn't replaced by uh, a new bar opening up just down the road that's not it's not the same thing because there's a, a whole lot where where you had your kids christened where you had your wedding reception all, all of these things these are all very important to people uh, so that's what we need from government is a, 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 a not a, not so much the financial support that has been issued during COVID and so on, but uh, a realization that these businesses all matter to our community, and without that, we're going to be in a very very difficult place in a few years. Okay, Ian. Well, what we've done is we've actually invited the MHKs down to our factory for the end of this month, because that way they can. Have a look around they can also get an understanding of how a small business is operating um going forward um it's going to be a difficult two years as dave says i think the next couple of years are, are going to be very tough for us um especially with ingredient prices we just hope for some form of stabilization with within the industry ingredients because we have to obviously sort from the commodity markets for sugars and powders mm. and stabilizers as I say, you know, that type of thing has increased to us between 150 and 400 percent. Well, uh, we're, we're just about out of time and I want to give yep, Amy no and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Ash, uh, Ashley, uh, uh, Miles, uh, just a, in a one, one word, really. Optimistic for the future? Um, possibly. <laughs> Miles? Yeah, very. 
<laughs> good. Oh, well, that is good. I'm Phil Gorn. Gorn and Myers and Gacy from.